Good morning, Lighthouse. We continue our series in the Gospel of Luke, and now we are 10 chapters into our study, and we've heard Jesus say a lot of incredible things. But today, this morning, Jesus' words are, are deeply shocking. He pronounces a, a series of most self-assured, self-important, self-exalting lines that you may have ever heard him say. Words that will uh, be rightly recognized as incredibly arrogant or overinflated, uh, that is, if they're not true. We, we find here in these well-attested, authentic words of Jesus, the removal of our ability to think Jesus was content to just be left as a small character in history, or that he was ever happy with being kept in a nice and neat position as a teacher or a simple rabbi among many. In the simple uh, moment that he's given us, it's not an ma- act of marking time. He is indeed wanting us to see him as the Son of God who then is Jesus. Listen to what he says as the answer to this question that we've been asking in our whole series in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 21. In the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your son who spoke these words. And Jesus, we pray that by your spirit, you would send in us a confidence that we hear you, that we are responding to you, that we're believing upon you, that our joy would come from you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When was the last time you rejoiced? You delighted in good news, maybe the good news of a child's birth or the arrival of a long-awaited friend or the great accomplishment that happened at work. When was the last time you were ecstatic and you were pumped? My sons and I are, have been watching this YouTube show about a surfer in Hawaii, and he ha- always has the same phrase in his videos. He says, I'm psyching. Uh, it means he's excited. And he says, says so much, this term, that he has he actually has a psych counter that seems to uh, add up the amount of times that he says it. And the more time he says it, though, maybe the less I'm believing that he actually is psyching. Can you really be psyching that much? I I don't really know. I mean, Hawaii waves seem nice, uh, but I don't know. Here Jesus is psyching. He is full of the Spirit, and he is rejoicing. What has gotten a hold of him? What is it that fills Jesus with joy? The context is this hour that it's being spoken of, a moment when Jesus sees the return of a large group of disciples so far that he has called and sent out the 72 who have now returned and they have proclaimed the kingdom of God in both word and with mighty deeds. They've gone around many towns and villages to do these great works. People are responding. They are getting this massive glimpse of God's grace to save And a great many are willing to repent of their sins as they call them to repent and turn to the king who is Jesus. Miracles of healing are being given. And Jesus says, he says, this is Satan falling from heaven. This is the kingdom of God overcoming the kingdom of Satan and is drawing near. All of this sight that Jesus sees leads him to rejoice. And these three stanzas are in his song. These three sets of phrases are really the the rejoicing that Jesus is giving. The first is that Jesus gives thanks. God the Father, he gives thanks to him for graciously revealing himself to little children and not to those who are seemingly wise. Secondly, Jesus rejoices that the Father hands all things to Jesus the Son. And so he can reveal God to all whom he chooses. And lastly, Jesus tells the disciples privately how blessed they are for being able to see this day that even old kings and prophets could not only dream of seeing. But just as we sometimes struggle to understand why people, the reasonings behind why people rejoice, to grasp 
why they're psyching so much. We can be a bit confused by what Jesus is so delighted in. And so we must find out. Because as we consider what Jesus delights in, it simultaneously demands something of us in form of our response. And so first of all, all of the sight of the kingdom of God being revealed through the disciples' ministry, Jesus stops in this moment and he praises his Father, particularly regarding who has been noticing the kingdom of God. See, a great many are able to see God at work, people being healed, miracles being done in Jesus' name. And they are seeing this kingdom of eternal significance being revealed before them. People are seeing heaven meet earth in this moment in the person of Jesus as the coming Messiah. And so some recognize this. And they see God at work, but not all. And we still see this as the case, and we still ask the question, why is that? Today, some people hear about Jesus and they love what they hear. Others see and hear about Jesus and all that he's done for them on the cross, and they're indifferent. They are totally, or they're totally against it altogether. We could be shocked. We could be shocked by this completely opposite set of responses to the same message, even upset at the, at the situation. Not all are hearing the gospel message, which is the same, and, and not all are having the same response. But here, Jesus isn't surprised but he's actually praising his father in worshipful appreciation for what he's doing. For he sees God revealing himself to sinners who need him, not to those who feel no need of him. Notice which ones are seeing their need of Jesus. Who is it that's responding to this moment? Jesus sees it. The Lord of heaven and earth is revealing himself and his kingdom to the least likely. And Jesus calls them little children. It's a symbolic phrase, a symbolic word choice that Jesus is saying. It's to the insignificant in the worldly standards, the childlike. See, children, above all, they know that they are in need. They grasp every moment of every day of their young lives that they are in need, that they are dependent, and that they know their lack. And so Jesus compares the little children with others who are not responding to those being wise in their own understanding. This is not to say that they are the smart people and those are the not smart, but it's to say that they're too smart for their own good. So you can have a high IQ and yet be humbled and able to respond and receptive to Jesus. You can also have a low IQ and still be terribly wise in your own eyes. And so what does it mean that Jesus delights in God in this moment. It says that he's delighting in God's gracious will. See, the difference between adults and children, humble and proud, wise in our own eyes, and the self-admitted fools is the same. We know we don't have what it takes, and such is the baseline beginnings of the Christian life. It's the very foundation of coming to know Jesus correctly. No one who receives the God of grace, unless they give up their own God and themselves being their own God, is ready. No one who comes to God accurately says, it's because I deserve it. It was more, uh, it was more with, with who, I was more with it than others. I was more put together than others. I was more able. I was more significant. I was more worthy. No one could say that. But we come to God as a child, and we say, God chose to reveal himself to me in my utter weakness. And it remains a gracious work, a gracious work of God to save sinners from their sin. And this is forever fundamentally different and a different experience than anything else in life. And Jesus delights in it. Jesus delights in the truth that God's grace remains absolutely at odds with the other, every other religious idea about salvation in our world all other paths of progress that we've ever heard, where we hear versions of you get what you pay for, you, you collect what you earn, you reap what you sow, which is at times eternally true of our judgment, but it's never true of God's salvation. The Lord of heaven and earth is doing a work of grace, and Jesus praises his Father as he sees this in action. It's the children that are seeing it. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul describes this very backstory of all who come to know Jesus. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. But God chose what was foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what was weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what was low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being can boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Saved by grace. But now the delight of Jesus that he's sharing, now it takes a shocking turn. In verse 22, Jesus says something even more surprising. This gracious will of his Father that he delights in, this plan of God, Jesus says, is actually up to me. See, your grace is actually my plan to accomplish. That's what Jesus is saying. Your will, God, is my will to provide. Let's read verse 22 again. He says, all things, not some things, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, No one knows the Son except the Father, or the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Talk about a volume increase on the nature and identity of Jesus. He shouts loud and clear that I am God, the Father's gracious plan. I'm the one delivering the Father's gracious work. It is up to me. Verse 22, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Tristan this week, our, in our, our ministry intern at Lighthouse, he and I were reading this passage, and he said at a point when we got to this moment, he said, man, I would love to be a fly on the wall as the disciples heard Jesus say these words. And that's exactly the case. These are significant words. There is no turning back from them. The disciples hear Jesus say, no one knows God the Father but the Son, or truly knows the Son but the Father. It's a perfectly clear declaration of Jesus' essential unity with God. Really, this whole passage is a Trinitarian declaration. You see the Son, Jesus, by the Spirit, taking, talking about his full unity with the Father. But now again, why? Why is Jesus letting us know he is one with the Father and the Father is one with him? Because he delights in willingly taking up his father's work as the son. And what is that work? To reveal him to whomever he chooses. The kingdom of grace that God is revealing in this world is being seen, he says, by the weak and the lowly, the needy, the poor in spirit. And it's the work of the son, Jesus says, to reveal God's grace to whomever he chooses. What does that mean? Firstly and simply, it means this. You're going to need Jesus to get to God. God the Father is known by a way of introduction, and that introduction is only through Jesus. Jesus says to the disciples at another point in the Gospels, no one comes to the Father but through me. He also says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It's the same point being made. If you get to know Jesus you are going to get to know God. But this is also what it means. You need Jesus to get to God because he is your only mediator between you and God. We have an incredible problem in our world today, and it's not found in the form of just one religion or one spiritual idea. It's sort of pervasive. It's not just a doctrine that's easily narrowed down, but it is doctrinal. It is this idea that you can find God by looking within you. You meet God by focusing on the God inside. The idea that there is no need of a mediator or a mediation to happen, a savior to be given, a redeemer to step in, who is essential as a conduit between you and God, but you can get there yourself. And so we live trusting that it is merely up to me to get to God. 
Whether we are talking about today's Facebook memes about believing more in yourself or holding on to that inner light within, or we are living in full-on Eastern, Eastern mysticism that is offered to us over the millennia, still you can see the same goal runs counter to what Jesus says here. You don't reveal the Father to yourself, but I, the Son, must reveal the Father to you. How differently our approach to God is, according to these primary distinctions. Jesus is either absolutely necessary, or he is not necessary at all. He's either vital, or he's trivial. And it will then be up to us to ask, which one really works? See, Jesus gives us undoubtedly the most self-exalting claims here to deal with. You come to God only through me. Only I can reveal him to you. Only I can bring you safely to the Father's grace, the Father's mercy, the Father's love, the Father's peace, and an eternal relationship with God. And you might say, but that kind of job description places Jesus right in the very center of everything. What Jesus is saying means that all other stories ever told, all history ever written, all time and eternity rests in the hands of this one and only incarnate Son of God. And if we think that, that we are thinking the right thing that Jesus is saying here. And so fittingly, that is exactly what Jesus claims before his disciples. In the third and final phrase of his rejoicing, he turns up the volume of his song to Max. As he says in verse 23, he says, it turns to the disciples and he tells them privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And so Jesus shares with delight in his eyes in this moment of history that the disciples are in and he tells them, look, you are blessed to be alive. And actually, all the prophets and the kings of old would be jealous to be you right now, to have this day in your shoes. Why? What would they be so jealous about? What would they want to see and what would they want to hear? And Jesus' answer is quite simple to that. Me. They were looking for me, for the day that I would come. It's an incredible set of words. I know that God the Father's gracious will. It is in my hands to accomplish. And then finally, all of history, from backwards to forwards, is about me. In other words, Jesus is preparing to be able to say exactly what he says in the book of Revelation as the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord when he says the words, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In all of this, Jesus rejoices. He delights. This is the self-exaltation of Jesus. And it leads every single person who hears these words about Jesus to in every single moment that we're in in life when we come to deal with Jesus, it leads us to the same question. This is the same one and only application really that comes from all of this. The question is, do you see Jesus as important as he sees himself? Do you see Jesus as important as he sees himself? Will you accept Jesus as central, as preeminent in your life, or are you unsure of that position for him? Are you just wanting Jesus to stay small, maybe fixed to a lesser job description? Maybe you would want him to just be one of many options, and if it works for you, good, but if another one works for you, even better. Do you want Jesus to be just one of the influences upon your life, like a, like a life coach giving you 10 easy tips to have a better week? He gives you just one religious experience, but he's not in charge of your whole existence. No doubt, the call of Jesus being central to our life and to our hope and to our meeting God, it strikes us really deeply. Because the problem of humanity, really all of humanity, of coming back to a relationship with God is not merely that, that sin is in our way. 
that we can't be near God because of sin. The problem even goes deeper than that. The problem is that we love sin. It's not merely that we, have an, uh, that we often have a worshipful uh, focus on other things that we love, other things that were more important, but that they're more important than God. The problem is that not, not only are we distracted from God, but that we find that God does not capture the heart in our absolute adoration, in our central focus and love and joy. And that is what we're made for. That's what the Bible says. That is what God calls us back to. The pure adoration of an almighty God. The 1600s catechism that we have said said many times in our church, it asks the first question is, what's the chief or primary end of mankind? And the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. John Piper, a pastor, helpfully adds to this the response, and so we most glorify God as we enjoy him forever. Such is the experience of what we are made for. It's the very end goal of the new heavens and new earth. It is is what it means to eat of the tree of life and live in the garden in peace. It is the purpose of your existence to be back with God, enjoying him and grasping without doubt or ever looking back and knowing that he alone is sufficient for you. To know his free grace that covers all your shame and rebellion. To feel the love of God poured out upon you is an all-satisfying satisfying source of eternal joy, to find God's powerful and perfect characteristics to be the most fulfilling vision of your whole life. That's what you're made for. How do we get there? How do you find God to be that satisfying? Here Jesus says, I alone can take you there, which means you cannot do it. You cannot fix your heart. You cannot make loving God happen. You cannot do any set of religious efforts to make God delightful again to your soul. No, you need Jesus for that. And Jesus offers it to you. For him to help you see God differently, to know God truly, and to be saved by God completely, Jesus is the way to enjoy God with all of your heart. Because you need Jesus to reveal the Father's love for you personally. How does he do so? It happens by even this moment today in this exact time that you're hearing this to again realize what the New Testament offers you. It offers you a clearer picture, even clearer than the kings of old or the ancient prophets that Jesus speaks of or even to the disciples that he's speaking to in these words. We can behold a greater picture, a more glorious finished work of Jesus that has been accomplished for you. You can see the the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. You can know that he has fully merited every bit of forgiveness that your soul desires and needs. He has overcome every bit of hell to love you and because he loves you. And in this, you can see God's unquenchable love for sinners as Jesus receives all the holy justice as he de- that is delivered upon him and God in Christ brings to us the unstoppable grace that we need to save us. As we see Jesus, the risen and reigning one over all history, and as we experience the unmatched care of Jesus for our soul every day by him filling us with the spirit to hear this simple truth every moment from Jesus. Jesus loves you. What does Jesus do? Jesus reveals in real terms, God loves you. The most eternally significant truth. And it is only received by a childlike faith in him. That is what moves us into the same rejoicing that Jesus is having as we agree that there is nothing, nothing better than the Father's love whom he reveals to us. But we must also confess in this very same moment today, and again and again, that in light of what Jesus gives us, in light of the love of the Father that he has revealed to us, we are so easily distracted, aren't we? How often 
How often our rejoicing in our Savior and the Father's love turns towards the limited and smaller satisfactions of just the next holiday and the other forms of escape. How quickly the eternal comfort from the ever-compassionate love of Jesus is turned sour by the next clouds of worries that seem to roll in from the week ahead of us. And once those fiery passions burn to introduce Jesus to your friends that they might have the Father's love revealed to, him, to them, how often those passions turn so cold and mediocre and the enthusiasm becomes a prayerlessness as we look at other lesser ambitions. What must we do? The call is to look. Look again at what the prophets and the kings long to see. Be reintroduced to the hero of your story who stands at the beginning and he stands in the middle and he stands at the end of your life. And that hero is not you and it's not me, it is Jesus. And let Jesus reveal himself to you again as he does so, he does so not to bore you with himself. He does so to save you. He does so to remake you. Jesus reveals himself, in fact, as the glorious center of all history, as the savior of the world, because he wants to ultimately give you himself. And he knows he is the greatest gift of all. The true characteristic of a life that truly knows Jesus like this is this childlike faith that makes no claim of our status, of our deserving, of our wisdom, but humbly lays a hold of Jesus with great rejoicing and says, I have him. I have him. Are you holding on to Jesus today? Are you holding on to this greatest of treasures? Are you holding on to your Savior as he reveals to you the love of the Father? Then blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for you open our eyes by your loving work to save. You open our eyes to see the love of the Father, a love we will never earn, never merit, but we are made for. It brings us the deep, all-satisfying joy that we could use for the rest of eternity to live on. And so, Lord, focus our attentions on your love again today with whatever swirling around our hearts and lives and minds, focus us on to what is really, truly the lifeblood of life, a relationship with you and the joy we find in your presence and your love. We pray this in your name.